Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our presentation. Uh, David and I have been working on tuning in a dramatic generation, uh, in particular in kernel updates in general. And um, somebody is phoning me right now. I'm sorry for that. I hope it will stop soon. Um, okay, the talk is divided in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about compression algorithms, um, comparing the XZ and Z standard algorithms for the um, use cases that we are interested in, building in a dramatist images on the one hand and kernel modules on the other hand. And the second part, I'm going to take a little broader view and look at kernel uh, and kernel module package installation and um, what uh, can be improved about it. And in the third part, David is going to give you a little more in-depth um, insight into his work on the CPIO ref linking um, uh, for in RAMFS images. Um, I am presenting this by screen sharing, and if you have any issues with that, you could either download the PDFs from a big blue button, or you could also use the reveal slides directly from here, um, so if the quality is bad or something like that. Okay, so um, if you are a Leap 15.3 user, you may find uh, the below um, familiar. It, it shows myself uh, installing an update kernel under leap 15.3 plus the sub packages kernel extra, kernel optional. And you can see here, um, well, the actual file installation is rather fast. Um, but then it seems that for some time nothing happens at all. Uh, and in general, um, installation or update of kernels is pretty slow on leap 15.3. And uh, it becomes even worse or even slower if you have kernel module packages installed on your system. If you pay attention to things like that, you may have noticed that it has actually become slower uh, on 15.3 than it was before on 15.2 or 15 sp 2 um, and in this talk, we will examine the reason for that and uh, present possible remedies and improvements um, with special attention to the creation of the Enedram FS. And here you can see the whole procedure took about uh, almost, almost a minute. Okay. So... Um, in the first part, I'm going to talk about compression algorithms. And uh, sorry, I may always make the same mistake here. So um, yeah, and as I said before, I will cover both uh, compression of the inner DRAMFS and compression of kernel modules. First about the inner DRAMFS. So we have been using XZ for that purpose since C12GA for so quite some time already. Um, and uh, quite rather recently, since kernel 5.9 or Dracut 54, um, that standard is supported upstream for that alternatively. And we are working towards uh, introducing this as default in C15 SP4. Um, when we discussed that on the research mailing list, I was asked to do a comprehensive study about that. And that's what I try to do. So I've been doing measurements on 20 different systems. Now, the issue is here that the payload, the, the uncompressed in a drama fest, is may be quite different between systems. So on, on some systems, you only have a very few modules. On others, you may have a lot. Um, and the compressibility of the payload varies too, uh, depending on architecture, for example. Um, typically, I saw uh, in the Dramaphys images 40 megabytes uh, plus minus seven, where this is a, the standard deviation. And of course, so, so I try to cover it as much as possible. Uh, covered all architectures that we support in SLE, uh, tested on virtual machines and bare metal, from a small single board ARM system to large servers with uh, hundreds of CPUs. And I was I also used um, the different operating systems that we have in our portfolio. Now let's look 
at the results. In this picture, you can see the amount of disk space saved by compression. So the, that's the red bar. Um, so uh, more is better here. And uh, the black bar indicates the standard deviations or the vari variability between the various systems I've tested. And uh, here you can see the different compression algorithms, starting with the current default, xz minus zero, and then that standard with different compression levels, 15, 9, and 3. You can see that on average, xz saves about 24 megabytes, um, uh, whereas that standard in the lowest level saves uh, 22. And, but you can also see that the difference between xz and that standard is much smaller than the overall variability between the, the uh, systems. And now, if we look at performance, again here, you see the same compression algorithms from top to bottom. And uh, this time uh, I'm showing the time required for the compression of the uncompressed image uh, in seconds. And um, well, this time lower is better, of course. And um, for every algorithm, I'm showing the single-threaded and multi-threaded uh, variant. So you can see that the variability is actually not so big. You see 3.5 seconds plus minus about half a second for XZ. And you can see that that, uh, that standard and level three is, is much, much faster. It's uh, about a factor of 10, 0 0.3 seconds. Um, Okay, so uh, summing up this part of the talk, I think it's pretty clear that, that uh, switching to that standard for Internet Ramifice compression makes a lot of sense. And um, the recommendation is to use the options minus T0, minus 3. Uh, minus T0 means activate multi-threading, which works well with that standard. It scales very well and achieves uh, consistent results, which is not the case for XZ. Uh, the cost for this would be typically about two megabytes disk space and the gain about three seconds per build of the anadromophus plus faster decompression speed. And, and David is going to mention that in his part of the talk again. This agrees with what, with what we expected based on previous studies. But also, uh, I should also say that the copy and write ref links that David is going to present may be, uh, perform even better than this. Okay, now the second part of uh, compression, uh, compression of kernel modules. So here, this is a, a rather recent feature. Exact has been used um, uh, only since C15 SP3 and also in Tumbleweed. And that standard became supported with K028 and kernel 513 in the beginning of this year. And we are still planning it for C15 SP4. Here, uh, for this, I have a table here regarding the effect of the various algorithms on disk usage. Uh, this is for x86-64, for the kernel for the default kernel. Um, uh, in the top row, you can see uh, SLE 15 sp 2 which uses uncompressed modules. And you can see the modules occupy about 170 megabyte. With XZ on SP3, that goes down to 35 megabytes. So we, we save about 135 megabytes. And, and uh, with that standard, you save less. As expected, the difference is a little more than, than 10 megabytes. It's interesting to note that the RPM package size is actually smaller for uncompressed modules. This is because uncompressed payload can be uh, compressed better during RPM build than uh, previously compressed modules. Again here, uh, the package size with Z standard is somewhat larger than with XZ. Um, now, what would be the effect uh, of the different algorithms on speed for module compression? I don't have hard numbers for you here, but uh, we can do some, some uh, evaluation. Um, the kernel typically loads between two megabytes and 20 megabytes of modules during boot, because the kernels typically don't use all installed modules, just a small fraction. And uh, this amount of data, 20 megabytes, is loaded pretty quickly on every modern system. Even the decompression doesn't matter really much in that context. For kernel building, not 
uninteresting for us uh, in, in OBS. I have seen that using that standard for modules, let's uh, let, let's the, the build time, this part spent during module compression go down from 30 seconds for XZ to about five seconds with that standard, which is nice, but still quite low or little compared to the overall total kernel build time, as you are all aware. But then there's another effect, and that's um, the runtime of that mod, um, and that's strongly affected by the module compression. And um, well, does that matter? Well, and that's um, a point that I'm going to discuss in the second part of the talk. Yeah, which is um, about profiling and the installation of the kernel and of kernel module packages. Um, yeah, so uh, coming back to my introductory slide and the slow kernel installation, what is it that is slowing down the kernel installation? Um, well, the answer is the, the first answer that most of the time is spent in a tool called Weak Modules 2. Um, this tool is responsible for everything related to kernel module installation. So let's look, uh, I hope you can see these uh, bars here. Um, what you can see here is time uh, for the installation of kernels. Uh, so less is better actually. And the, the, the time is now split up between different parts. So the blue, th the blue part at the, on the left side is the time that RPM actually needs to copy the files from the package to the file system. The rest of the time is almost completely spent in weak modules to calling different other processes. And then here the, the orange part is weak modules to calling that mod and the green part is weak modules to calling Dracut for and uh, well, various stages of Dracut. The light green is Dracut initializing its own modules. The dark green is the creation of the init RAMFS. And the other is, is other stuff that, that uh, Dracut does, for example, syncing the disk and so on. And then these uh, items on the rest here are kind of rest some seconds spent in other tasks. So um, yeah, and that's what weak modules two does. It calls, when we install internal at first, in calls zepmod and then it needs to check every installed kernel module package it must check the kernel abi compatibility and if uh, the aba is compatible it creates some links for the kmp and finally it calls drake it to uh, build in a drama and the same thing is repeated then for the sub packages like kernel default extra kernel default, default uh, optional and the picture also shows now here, here you can see that the yes, SLES 15 SP3 uh, is much quicker than SLED 15 SP3, which is much quicker than LEAP 15.3. And that is because of the additional sub packages. SLED, SLED adds the kernel default extra package and LEAP adds the kernel default optional package on top. And each takes a certain amount of time. You can also see that indeed, SLE 15 SP2 was remarkably faster than uh, SP3 is today. And the reason is this orange part here, mainly the time spent in depth mod. Okay. Um, for KMP installations, it, the picture is similar here. And you can see that the time spent in depth mod is even more important. You have a dark orange part here, which is um, spent in LS in the LS init RD2. So for, for KMP installation, what happens is that um, the weak modules 2 has to check KABI compatibility for every kernel installed. And if successful, again, it has um, into create symbols and run that mod. And every kernel ABI check is done doing uh, by calling that mod. Finally, it has to check whether the module installed is part of the initial run disk, which requires calling in Alice init RD and schedule a rebuild of the init RAMFS. So um, we considered uh, what can be done to speed this up. So one rather low hanging fruit was to replace the slow Alice init RD program from Dracut with a faster one. We already have this in Tumbleweed and actually also in SP3. Um, 
The second thing um, is to use CPIO reflinking for the NetRamifest creation, or if that can't be done, use that standard. The third one is to use that standard for kernel modules, as I've talked about before. Then we can uh, avoid repeating, re building the Enadramavis repeatedly by postponing Enadramavis building uh, to the post trans stage from, from post. And we can do this for kernel sub packages like kernel default extra. And this is where we stand at uh, for the 15 SP4. This is probably what we will have in SP4. But we can do more. Um, we can postpone an environment first building for the kernel base package as well. And uh, we can improve that mod. That mod is the reason that mod is so slow with that is that it always looks at every installed module, it has to parse more, um, several thousand modules every time, which is not necessary if you just have to add one module. So um, I have got a patch set that uh, may fix this. It's not upstream yet, but it works quite well. Um, finally, we can use parallelization for the operations that go over multiple kernels. For example, we can uh, invoke drag it in parallel for several kernels. We can also try to optimize Dragit itself, but well, that's that's not our topic today. Okay, let's look at uh, what these optimizations improve. Um, this is the same picture that you saw before on the kernel slide, and here's the kernel state of the current state of affairs. You can see SP2 uh, being much faster than SP3, leap being slower than than SLES. Okay, let's see what we can do. First, the LS on initRD has no effect here because uh, LS initRD is not used in this scenario. Using CPIO ref linking has a noticeable effect. You can see already down from 65 to about five, 55 seconds. Now, on top of that, we uh, use a standard for compressing the modules instead of uh, XZ, and you can see that it has a huge effect. We are now below 40 seconds. Um, small step back, instead of CPL ref, ref linking, we use that standard. You can see here this, the dark green bar becomes a little wider so that a little more time is spent uh, creating the anagramophys, but the difference is, is rather low. So that standard is quite good. So and again, so then we can postpone uh, the, the Enidramophis building to post-trans. This is why the green is now right on, uh, on the right side of the orange. That's the post-trans stage. And uh, well, you can see we, that's where we are at SP4, uh, around uh, 40 seconds. Well, we are not there yet. If we uh, if we postpone the Enadramophis building for the base package too, we are we gain another oh, wait, almost 10 seconds um, by uh, the incremental depth mod buys us another and um, and parallelization has no effect here. Let me mention that the incremental deck mode was, would have a bigger effect if we had not um, switched from, from uh, XZ to, Z, uh, to uh, Z standard before. Same thing for KMP installation. Here again is the current state of affairs. LS, optimizing LS init RD buys us some uh, non some significant seconds here. Um, using CPIO ref linking also has a nice effect, but the big one is uh, using that standard compressed modules that, that uh, cuts the amount of time spent in that mod to less than a half. Um, if we go back for the InnerGramFS, go back to that standard instead of CPIO ref linking, we, again, we are a little slower than before, but the difference is small. Um, again, this is by, by, by using post transfer sub packages, we don't gain anything more because that's already the case for kernel module packages. And this is where we stand for SP4 probably. So that what future improvements, um, pushing more into post trans has no effect here for the same reason as before. But incremental depth mod uh, gives us almost another 50% uh, 
acceleration and um, parallelization also uh, improves matters quite a bit here. Yep, and uh, yeah, there's, with that, uh, I come to the conclusion of my part of the talk. So the, the deterioration uh, for, or the, the slowness for installing kernels or kernel module packages in SP3 is mostly caused by the XZ compressed modules, um, which don't work too well with, with that mod. Um, the profiling that I did showed multiple bottlenecks, which had to be fixed up one by one with different means. But um, cumulative savings are quite good. And all in all, we, for kernel installation, we can go get back in my examples from 66 seconds down to 21 seconds, where at E15 SP4, we would stand around 40 seconds. And for KMP installation, the effect is even bigger. We can get down from 100 seconds to 15 seconds. Where again, 315 SP4 is around 40. So, and um, one, of course, very important factor in this is the generation of the NetGramFS. And um, yeah, with that, I'm going to pass on to David. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to cover uh, the work we've been doing on uh, the NetGramFS side. Um, or specifically uh, creating InitRamFS images with uh, reflinks or shared extents. Um, so Martin, next slide, please. Oh, did you switch um, over to me? Looks like we've gone to slide sharing. Yeah, I, uh, I have okay. no button for sharing it's my okay. screen anymore. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that was me. I switched. That's the, fine. Uh, <laughs> wasn't should, quite I, uh, should I switch it back to Martin? No, no, no this no, is no, fine. No. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, basically with um, InitRamFS, we have um, a bunch of uh, kernel modules, um, binaries and libraries, which we need to pack in. Uh, so on the root file system, which we need to pack into this um, InitRamFS image. Um, so basically a CPIO archive. <clears throat> uh, the plan with InitRamFS uh, reflinks is that rather than um, reading all of these um, files and writing them out again um, with compression and, and symbol stripping, um, we can just use um, the reflink functionality of the underlying um, copy on write file system um, and just tell the file system to, to clone um, these files and um, yeah, be done with it basically that way. Um, so this has um, two beneficial aspects. So basically the um, uh, space saving aspect or storage utilization, and then also um, for IO itself. So rather than doing the um, reads and writes, we're just telling the file system to do a, a metadata update. Um, Another benefit is that we can um, make use of um, kernel module compression alongside um, in at RevFS reflinks. Um, so it is still um, helpful in that way. There are though uh, quite a few uh, restrictions and limitations. Um, so as, as mentioned, the underlying file system needs to support reflinks. Um, so for SUSE distributions, that's um, ButterFS or XFS. The archiver or application itself needs to support um, or make um, yeah, reflink uh, specific or enabled IO uh, syscalls or IOctals. Um, so we have this new um, copy file range syscall, which is um, useful for, for this purpose. Um, it also um, attempts a, a reflink, so basically a, a copy on write clone. And if that's not possible, then it um, can fall back to a um, in kernel splice IO. So you still have some optimized IO if uh, reflinks aren't possible. Um, another limitation is that uh, the uh, sources, um, Dracket staging area and um, destination paths all need to be on the same file system um, at the same mount point. Um, so that's um, obviously um, a, a problem if we do move to a different um, partitioning scheme. Um, so if, if you go back and watch uh, Ludwig's talk or um, Fabian, uh, Fabian's talk from today, um, 
yeah, there were some proposals to, to potentially move to um, the FE fat partition for init RAMFS, um, which would, yeah, then uh, mean that ref links don't, don't buy as much there. Um, another downside is um, fragmentation. Um, so basically with um, regular uh, read-write um, copy of uh, uh, for init RAMFS, we'd have one nice contiguous range uh, generally for the, the inner RAMFS image. Um, with ref links, we then potentially have um, the files scattered at all uh, different offsets on disk. So that's then a problem, um, especially for um, spinning rust. Um, and uh, finally, uh, ref links are um, sensitive to alignment. Um, so um, if we look uh, on this page, I've just sort of shown the um, CPIO um, archive headers that we have for each entry in the CPIO archive. We have um, a, a 110 byte um, fixed header. We then have the variable um, file name and that's followed by the um, data segment. Um, so it's this um, data segment um, in the CPIO archive, which we need to have then aligned to the file system um, block size. Um, so that's obviously a challenge for um, creating these um, reflink in at RAMFS images. There are some boot time considerations as well. Um, so the, the bootloader needs to be capable of uh, writing, uh, sorry, reading in at RAMFS uh, uh, reflinked in at RAMFS archives. Um, we did actually run into um, yeah a quite critical um, grub bug um, with uh, it not being able to read um, butterfs files which had gaps between extents. Uh, thankfully, uh, Chu was able to to develop a, a fix for that. Um, some other considerations were that um, uh, so. Uh, as a performance benefit, um, we obviously can skip uh, decompression of the init RAMFS or CPIO archives on boot. Um, so we have a, uh, um, a boot time uh, performance improvement there, um, but that could be um, outweighed by uh, the uh, reading of fragmented init RAMFS images, which is, is done by the bootloader. Um, uh, finally, um, I just wanted to touch on um, some other work I'd, I'd done on um, yeah, avoiding um, M time preservation uh, in, in kernels. So um, currently when the kernel's unpacking the init RAMFS image or the uh, CPIO archive, it um, takes the M time from each entry and um, tries to preserve that. Um, so basically creates the, the files and directories. And then um, after uh, creation, it uh, then updates the M time on all of those entries. Um, which then consumes uh, some uh, yeah, uh, memory and CPU resources. Um, so that's only necessary if we actually care about uh, the M time sort of matching between um, CPIO and uh, the init RAMFS file system. My assumption would be that um, we don't in any way rely on that. So I provided a patch set which um, allows us to, to disable that. Um, yeah, hopefully that'll land upstream soon. Um, now on to the um, CPIO archiver implementations. So we actually went down um, two paths. Um, I'll just briefly touch on the first option uh, or first attempt. Um, so this was uh, done um, yeah, by myself with uh, Luis Enriquez. So some help uh, from Luis, thanks. <laughs> um, we added their um, copy, on, uh, copy file range uh, calls to the uh, GNU CPIO copy out code path. Um, so this allowed GNU CPIO with a new um, minus minus ref link option. Oh, there's Hannes. Do you have a yeah. question, Hannes? Yeah, a short question. Do I get this right? So that you're essentially writing a large sparse file or a sparse, a sparse tar archive? Uh, for alignment? Uh, no, no, it, basically the resulting CPIO archive. Uh, yes, so for alignment, um, there are some sparse um, sections within the arc, uh, within the file itself. So the okay, because I still try to figure out how the CPIO archive actually would look like once it's done. So whether this is because you well you can't copy the data in that is the whole point. 
So you essentially will have to have a really, well, what do you have actually? Uh, we have <laughs> look like? we have a huge amount of extents. Um, so basically made up of uh, CPIO headers. Uh, so this uh, one 10 byte header, um, the file path, um, and then we have the ref linked um, extent um, for the, the data segment for that file. Um, ah, right. So, you so for every single data. In, so you actually have a reference to the individual segments. And yes. Okay, right. So we have, as mentioned, it can be incredibly fragmented because um, yeah, we can have extents sort of all over disk, um, which are then ref linked into this um, CPIO archive. Right. Um, okay. As the data okay. segment. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, with this uh, GNU CPO implementation, we also had to add um, a, a chain parameter. Um, so this was basically to allow us to um, append to an existing CPIO archive, um, uh, another archive. Um, so I, sh I should mention that um, InterMFS is generally uh, made up of two CPIO archives, or at least in the SUSE case. So we have the um, CPU microcode um, as the first CPIO archive. And then we have a second archive, which is then uh, the file system uh, image. So this chain parameter allowed us to um, append to that um, existing archive um, in a ref link friendly way without you know, piping standard out. Um, Alignment uh, for this implementation was provided by a separate binary. Um, so I, I worked on a binary which was then added to, or was um, yeah, added to the uh, Dracut code base, um, which basically uh, looked at where the data segment would land in the InitRamFS image or in the CPO archive, and would then sort of inject um, uh, basically padded or zeroed files um, into the archive such that the data segment for the actual important file data um, was aligned to the file system block size. Um, yeah, this first implementation um, we actually abandoned um, mostly due to um, lack of engagement from upstream GNU CPIO. So um, sadly, I think the project upstream is, is mostly dead. There's sort of one guy who um, pops up every now and then, but um, it doesn't receive much attention. Um, so we then also looked at or implemented a, a second option, which was um, Dracut CPIO. Um, so this was a, a from scratch implementation um, written in Rust. Yes, I realize it's, it's a bit of a meme nowadays, but um, we did have, in my opinion, some um, good reasons to go with a, a new implementation in Rust. Um, so the main reason is that it's it's quite a simple format. I mean, um, we're only um, interested in um, archive creation for the kernel. So we don't need to support um, legacy CPIO um, uh, formats. Um, we don't need to su uh, support extraction. Um, the cool um, thing about uh, the Rust standard library or at least recent uh, Rust standard library implementations that it all, is that it also makes use of um, copy file range. So it handles um, ref linking for us without um, needing to call anything special. Um, we can just use a regular IO copy um, our standard library call. Um, also upstream Dracket was uh, looking at Rust for other purposes. Um, so um, I think Harold Hoyer had, had already worked on some proof of, proof of concept code for um, yeah, rewriting Dracut install, I think, uh, in Rust. Also, um, finally, uh, we could, with this option, um, integrate uh, the support for padding um, in the Dracut CPIO binary itself. Um, so it was a bit simpler. And I actually took a different approach in this implementation. Um, so rather than injecting um, just zeroed files into the archive, um, I used the, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I, I used the, the path um, uh, field and padded that out with, with extra zeros um, to then align the data segment. Um, so it's, it's a simpler option for padding, um, but, 
uh, yet it's restricted in that it can only pad out to um, path max, so 4K. Um, so that means that we don't pad or align every every data segment. So it's it's more best effort, but it does a pretty good job um, in uh, yeah um, simply aligning um, data segments for CPIO. Question from Hannes was. Um, what would happen if the Rust library does not attempt ref links? Um, that's uh, a good point. So we are relying currently on that um, functionality. Um, so it's true that uh, the library could change underneath, um, but we can also change uh, Drake at CPIO to, to make explicit calls to um, copy file range. Um, I think if, if that were to change, we can um, yeah, have the explicit functionality within Track at CPIO. Um, another question from uh, Andreas Ferber. Depending on Rust, would seem to make the bootstrap cycle for um, OpenSUSE or SLE larger, making it more difficult to port. Um, yes, that's true. Um, I haven't actually looked at um, Rust support on sort of the more exotic architectures. Um, I don't know where we sit there. I thought that um, other um, other projects had had already included um, Rust, making it sort of a, a dependency for for most architectures now. Um, but I should say that um, Dracket doesn't have to use, or at least with um, the patches I submitted, Dracket doesn't have to use Dracket CPIO. So the default case um, is still to use uh, the GNU CPIO archiver unless um, it's it's provided a, a separate um, option. So on to the benchmarks now. Um, so I ran these benchmarks on uh, Tumbleweed from last month. Um, yeah, just a simple two CPU VM with eight gigs RAM. Um, the important point here is that I had the um, uh, raw QEMU disk images backed by tempfs on the hypervisor, so it's um, very low latency storage. Um, I was comparing um, three options, so basically XZ um, in RMFS compression with uh, symbol stripped. Um, that was uh, until now the, the default um, compared also with Z standard, um, which is the uh, new default um, as as described by Martin, um, so a good performing um, compression algorithm. And finally, um, Dracket RefLink. So this is enabled with this um, enhanced CPIO equals yes um, per parameter for Dracket. Um, I also had to uh, tell Dracket to uh, use a, a different uh, temporary directory just so that um, everything stayed on the same um, file system and mount point. Um, and of course, yeah, uh, symbol stripping was also disabled uh, for reflinks. So for ButterFS, um, the Dracket runtime um, was, yeah, improved uh, quite sig significantly. So went from 17 seconds with XZ to 10 seconds. Um, <clears throat> the boot time was um, also improved. Uh, so this is the boot of the kernel to um, in invocation of init. Um, it was improved, but it's also, um, as Martin showed earlier, it's quite comparable to, to Z standard. One key point there, though, is that that doesn't include the uh, bootloader um, init RMFS read time. So um, we need to do some more profiling work there to um, see how uh, Grub handles uh, the uh, um, fragmented um, CPIO archives. Um, for um, storage utilization, um, we can see that, um, yeah, we have a considerable saving um, in um, exclusive disk extents. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, yeah, I should also mention there that we had some problems with um, ButterFS FIE map results being quite inconsistent across runs. So I'm more inclined to um, believe the XFS results there, um, which gave us very consistent um, FIE map results. So there we can see that um, the exclusive um, 
storage utilization is down to around eight megabytes um, for the uh, ref linked in RamFS images. Um, so that's um, almost half the uh, size of the Z standard option. Excuse me. And with that, um, yeah, I think I'd, I'll move on to just a brief summary, which um, is I think already or was covered by Martin. Um, I think uh, we should definitely, at least if we um, do stick with our current um, uh, partition or um, file system recommendations, um, it would make sense to use uh, RefLink CPIO archives for performance and um, storage utilization reasons. Uh, Z standard definitely makes sense um, if uh, ref links aren't possible. Uh, we could also or should also consider disabling um, modification time preservation um, in the kernel extraction path. And the remain remaining things were, um, yeah, points already covered by Martin. So uh, switching module compression and um, improving uh, the update performance. And with that, I think um, we'll move to questions. Any questions? There is something in the chat. Uh, one is a comment from Hannes. What would happen if the Rust library does not attempt reference? I don't remember the context when- I, 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 I covered that, that earlier. earlier. Um, so I, I mentioned that um, we would then need to change um, uh, Dracket CPIO to explicitly call um, copy file range. Okay. And yeah, so both of us were on such a sure. So are there any more questions live or in chat? Everyone agrees with our proposals. Great. Yeah. Yeah, Andreas, please. Sorry, with the microphone, it works better. Um, would the proposed change of the compression algorithm for the modules in the, in the first half of the um, talk, would that um, transparently be handled by um, like RPM dependencies in OBS builds, or might that have effects also on, for example, the solid driver program that may need to be considered? Um, it requires a change in the uh, RPM builds, uh, RPM config uses scripts um, that, yeah, the, the scripts need to uh, be able to recognize that standard compressed modules as modules and uh, to um, make sure that it provides uh, the KMOD provides and KSM provides are correct but um, we've covered that already and indeed uh, there are some other uh, side effects uh, there are quite a number of tools that that look at lib modules and try to find module files and they are easily um, yeah, they easily fail because they look at .ko, .ko, .xz or whatever, and and if, if the modules have a different extension, they fail. But but I think we have covered already quite a few of these issues. And there may be user or or customer scripts, of course, as well that that do these things. But but most of that should have been fixed while while we introduced XZ compression because it's the same class of issues. You just add one more extension, basically. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, comments? Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I would like to thank again both presenters for an interesting talk. Thanks for joining.